So the Fire Emblem series is definitely an interesting one to talk about online. The somewhat obscure series that didn't even come to America until its seventh entry has suddenly gained a fair footing as a mainline Nintendo franchise, to the point where a ton of its characters end up in Super Smash Brothers, and every time one gets added, people get pissed off. Even in cases like Byleth, where the character is like actually unique and not just a clone of the three other Fire Emblem characters that are exactly the same as Marth. And besides its role in just generally annoying Smash players, the Fire Emblem series is a game in its own right, one that has been garnering increasingly more attention and love as the years have gone on. A franchise almost about to die that was miraculously saved by Fire Emblem Awakening and then brought into even more popularity by Fire Emblem Three Houses, players have been wondering, what are they gonna follow up this particular game with? And the answer apparently was a crossover game. So today, we're going to talk about the latest entry in the Fire Emblem franchise. Fire Emblem Engage. Let's roll. So first booting up the game, you can definitely tell this is gonna be a bit of a different vibe than we saw with Three Houses. With this really insane Forkid style opening, you just know that this game might not take itself 100% seriously the entire time. And in many ways, that is the case. This is a much more lighthearted Fire Emblem game than Three Houses was. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because we don't necessarily need all of our stories to be super dark and depressing. However, this particular game, I think, stumbles a little bit in some of its story execution. So as the player, you take control of the Divine Dragon, a character whose default name is Alir, but you can name him basically whatever you want. And... I think this status as Divine Dragon is definitely the thing that rubs me the wrong way with this story, because the writing, especially early on, seems a little too self-congratulatory. All the characters are talking about how amazing you are as Divine Dragon. Oh, Divine Dragon, you're so wonderful. Oh, you're the most amazing commander ever. And it can just get a little grating after a while. Like, essentially, this character is a deity to all of the other characters in the game, and it just, ugh. I didn't like it in Fates how everyone was that way towards Corrin, and I don't like it here. That being said though, the story does have its moments. It's just weighed down by this kind of goofy tone and just some really absurd things that happen late in the game that they're dumb. Like it, it's a cool moment, but like it doesn't make it any less stupid when it happens. Overall though, the story is not really the main draw for this game, unlike some previous Fire Emblem games. If you loved Awakening and Three Houses for their story, you might want to look elsewhere. That being said though, the game does actually look and sound fairly good. There is a fantastic soundtrack that underpins pretty much the entire game, and especially compared to Three Houses, this game just looks really nice especially given the fact that it's on the Switch hardware. I really like this 3D-ish anime style. I think it works for the franchise really well, and I think this is definitely the look the franchise should keep with going forward. However, I think the main draw that makes this game interesting and honestly makes it a pretty decent Fire Emblem game is the fact that the gameplay is just probably some of the best the series has seen in a while. So after everyone complained about Three Houses being a little uh, oversimplistic in terms of its maps, this game does a lot to kind of rectify that. This game has significantly more to play with than that game did. In terms of base gameplay, it's the same as Three Houses or basically any other Fire Emblem game. It's a turn-based tactical strategy game where you first move with all your units, your opponent moves with their units, and you go back and forth until either your win condition has been satisfied or your defeat condition has been satisfied. On top of that, just like other previous games, you have the option of deciding whether or not you want to have permadeath enabled, as well as having various difficulty settings that can be toggled down, but never up. Returning after its absence in three houses is that of the weapons triangle. This time though, with a few interesting modifications to the system to say the least. The biggest one that you're going to notice during gameplay is the break system. Now when a unit attacks 
with a weapon that is strong against another weapon, it will automatically induce a break on an enemy, stopping any counterattacks from them in this particular combat, as well as preventing them from counterattacking at all in the next, which allows you to tear through enemy units without taking any damage. In addition, some of the weapons outside of the traditional triangle have their own unique system. That being the case of Arts, which is basically this game's replacement for Claws, being good against all of the other three types of alternate weapons, that being Tomes, Knives, and Bows. Another major change to the weapon system is something that is completely new to this game, that being the introduction of Smash Weapons. What these weapons do is that in exchange for always attacking last, even when the user themselves initiates combat, they have the ability to smash an enemy which, if they're able to move, will push them back one space from the direction you attacked it, which might potentially push an enemy into the range of one of your units. Although you have to be careful because, like with Break, enemies can use it too. However, despite this system's return to the franchise, another notable system has been removed, that being that of weapon durability. Similar to Fire Emblem Fates, weapons are now infinite use, with the exception of stabs, obviously, because that would be a little too broken if you just had infinite heals, which I think is fine. Weapon durability was a system that the franchise has had, but I think after Breath of the Wild, people are just getting annoyed with weapon durability in games, so that's probably why they took it out again. Either way, you adapt to the fact that it's gone fairly quickly. Also, Part of the reason that weapon durability was in three houses probably was the introduction of combat arts, which are gone in this game. In terms of other things that have been taken out from three houses, the ability to learn magic is gone in replacement with, as I mentioned before, stabs and tomes. This means that any character can use pretty much any spell or healing ability so long as they're in the right class to use them. And that's another thing that changed. The fairly complex system of promotions and exams is completely missing from this game. Instead, we are back to how leveling happens in pretty much every other Fire Emblem game. You have a base class that levels up from one to 20, and from any time between level 10 and 20, the player is able to promote to an advanced class which then resets their level to level one, which then can be leveled up to 20, reset to one again, and so forth, basically infinitely. This takes out several things, such as having to learn proficiency in a skill before advancing to your advanced class. Either way though, as what I've been saying might note, this game doesn't have too many similarities to Three Houses, and that's something that some of the reviews might have been a little too harsh on the game about, is that this thing that people liked in Three Houses wasn't there. Most notably, the calendar system that predicated all of three houses is gone. There are elements of that social system, like being able to share meals and whatnot, but you don't have activity points or any limited time to do different things. You have as much time as you want as you have this map that you freely explore. Very similar to Fire Emblem Awakening, which I think is probably the more comparable game to this one. While I did enjoy Three Houses and I do like its systems, I am definitely okay with this game being a little more similar to other Fire Emblem games and just sort of allowing that time management system to be Three Houses thing. Because especially during the second half of the game, constantly going back to the monastery made very little sense. However, let's move to maybe the one thing that makes this game unique and will probably not show up in later games. That is the emblem system. So the true depth of this game's combat comes with engaging these various emblems. These are essentially representatives of all of the previous Fire Emblem games. Since this is the anniversary game, we have all these references and callbacks to those particular games. The system is fairly simple. A unit can engage an emblem and then take them into combat where as they battle with those particular emblems engaged, they gain additional experience to increase their bond with that emblem. As they do that, they gain various skills that they gain from having the emblem engaged, as well as allowing the player to inherit skills from emblems that they've previously bonded with, allowing you to engage multiple emblems as you're playing, and then sort of mix and match which skills you inherit. In addition, during combat, a character is able to engage with their emblem, which essentially fuses the two together 
and allows them to perform a special move once per engage, as well as gain access to various weapons that are part of that particular emblem. The engage ability can open up a lot of things. In some cases, it might give you a weapon that has an advantage against, say, flyers or dragons, or it might, in some cases, allow you to use the super move to one-shot an enemy that you might otherwise not have been able to take out. However, the true beauty of the emblem system lies in their role in the story somewhat, that being in the form of the emblem paralogs. These are optional missions that you can take on with various emblems, although honestly, if you want to be able to play optimally, which in some maps you definitely want to have as much power as possible, you're going to have to do them. They're essentially maps from previous games that are particularly notable. These maps all have the same goal, defeat the enemy emblem in combat. However, what makes them unique is that not only are they the same layout as the various maps from those games, they also have similar gimmicks. For example, Byleth's Paralog, which is similar to the orbs that are being stolen during the Tomb of the Goddess map, where you fight against the Flame Emperor. Overall, I think these Paralogs are where the true challenge lies in the game. While the base game felt easy, especially in some of the earlier chapters, these Paralogs very quickly became very lengthy and challenging to complete, especially certain ones. Leaf being the primary one that was very, very difficult to complete. However, the difficulty is not just reserved to these paralogs. The entire game in general is just a considerable deal more difficult than Three Houses, even on normal. In particular, the maps that have goals other than route the enemy or defeat the enemy commander are insanely challenging and are a nice change of pace, especially given their absence from the previous game. Overall though, while the story is nothing incredible to write home about, and in some cases a little on the cheesy side, I think the gameplay of Fire Emblem Engage is a very promising direction for the franchise. And if we stick with gameplay like this, as opposed to more simplistic gameplay like in Three Houses, we have a fantastic future for the franchise on our hands. I would highly recommend anyone who's been on the fence about this game to pick it up for that strategy gameplay alone. It is absolutely worth it.